All right, amen. They're in Romans chapter 14. That last phrase that they said, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. I think that's a good summary for this whole chapter where it's talking about the different holy days and meats and drinks. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you doubt you're in sin is what it's teaching. The goal of this chapter is not it's it's to not cause your brother to sin because of your meat or not to cause your brother to think that they're in sin because they eat a certain meat or they don't eat a certain meat or they keep a certain feast or they don't keep a certain feast. The goal is to say, hey, don't cause your brother to think that he's in sin over something that God may not have been very specific about. There are certain things that are somewhat vague or there's, there's room. God has said a certain thing and if you add to it or if you take away from it and then you make your own opinion and judge your brother against that, you may cause them to doubt or may cause your brother to think that they're in sin. And this is what, what it's talking about here. For example, if, if Brother Ben said, I just feel that the Lord leads me on Tuesday afternoon to go to the beach and meditate and pray. I say, well, Ben, that's not really in the Scriptures, brother. You shouldn't do that. Well, now, I would be in sin for, saying, for causing him to doubt or call, t telling him that it's a sin for him to do that. But if Ben says, I have determined that I want to take time out of my week and I'm going to call this time holy and I'm going to make it holy and I'm going to honor the Lord, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. Now, obviously, there's a bigger application to the Sabbath day, eating pork, those sort of things. And there are many, many false prophets in the world. The Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Yeah. There are many false prophets that want to attach to a holy day or take away from a holy day you know or a meat whether or not you do certain customs physical customs and we know that those things were a shadow of things to come one such false prophet was you know the group of the seventh day adventists yeah. Yeah. you cannot read romans 14 without thinking about a seventh day adventist mm -hmm. yeah. right in romans 14 here where we're at tonight you know the seventh day adventists they like to attach themselves to vegetarianism they like to attach themselves to worshiping the Sabbath. Now these are things that go against what the Bible says. And here in Romans 14, look at verse 1, it says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. The first thing we look at here is that there is a, there is a weakness to think that you have to only eat herbs. Right. There is a weakness to say, God forbids me from eating meat. Okay? But uh, notice it also, it warns us about doubtful disputations. If anybody's ever known an adamant vegetarian or, or vegan or ovo lacto vegetarian, they've all these funny names, they're usually causing these doubtful disputations. Yeah, they usually want to argue with you. The Bible warns us about arguing with them. Yeah. But there's a really big elephant in the room when it comes to this chapter and Seventh-day Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventists are not saved. Yeah, they are right. not Amen. saved. Notice right. it says, if they're weak in the faith. The Seventh-day Adventists are not in the faith of the Bible. They're not in the they're faith not. of Jesus Christ. That's they are right. not Christians. They are just like Jehovah's Witnesses right. yeah. or yeah. Mormons. Amen. They want you to think that they're Christian. Come on in, and but they, but when you get down to their doctrine, you find all these strange cultish things. Right. You know, in Romans four, look at verse ten here, where it says, "But why dost thou judge thy brother?" What it's talking about here in verse ten, judging your brother. This chapter in context is dealing with a Christian that believes it's wrong for them to eat meat, or maybe they want to do something specific on a day. And again, that's for a brother. That's for somebody in the faith. In the second half of that, it says, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Hey, the judgment seat of Christ is for born-again believers. Yep. Yep. The Seventh-day Adventists will not be there. Right. Right? Right. They have a whole different perspective about judgment. They are not my brother. They're not my sister. They're unsaved deceivers. They yeah. need to be shown the truth. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They have faith in Ellen Gold White. They do not have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? They are so messed up. They have faith in this lady, Ellen White. They don't believe in Jesus for salvation alone. They hold her writings on par with Jesus, and they have all sorts of strange things about Jesus. Yeah. They forget that the Bible says that a woman should not usurp the authority of a man. Amen. They ignore right. that. They don't read that. No, they, don't. they forget 
that in Deuteronomy 18 it says that if a false prophet prophesies in the name of the Lord yeah. and this thing does not come to pass, right. that they should be put to death. That's right. Ellen White was a date setter. Mm -hmm. She predicted the end of the world more than one time and they all failed. Yeah. Yeah. She's a total false prophet and a heretic. Yeah. yeah, put her to death according to the Bible. Ellen White says that the devil is a co-redeemer with Jesus. Wow. That when the devil suffers for sin, he's suffering for part of our sin. He's taking part of that burden as a co redemp Are you kidding me? Yeah. Talk about some wicked, strange doctrine. Yeah, and most people don't know what she has written. I have read that in her book. I'm not repeating a rumor. I'm not telling you what a YouTube video says. I have read this in her own book with my own eyes. Wow. She is a liar and a false prophet. She said that Jesus was not fully human. But then later she goes back and says, well, but Jesus clearly wasn't God. He wasn't heavenly. She has this strange view on the Trinity. She doesn't believe in the Godhead as it were. They try to say that Jesus was just an angel. And she contradicts herself many times over in her own writings. The Seventh-day Adventists teach that coffee and meat must be rejected. Talk about wicked. Hey, we're in a Baptist church. Man. Hey, you can't have any coffee. Man, get out of here, you heretic. Yeah, right. right? Don't judge me over my coffee now. Yeah, get out. Right? <laughs> they, the the Seventh-day Adventists teach that going to church on Sunday is accepting the mark of the beast. Wow. That's literally what they teach. They twist the Scriptures to come up to that point. They also teach that when you die, you don't really go to hell. That your soul goes to sleep and then it's woken up and then it just burns real quick and it ceases to exist. Yeah. Now, Ellen White is in the hell that she doesn't believe exists. Yeah, that's right. I want to read a quote from her. It says in her book called The Great Controversy, how repugnant to every emotion of love and mercy and even to our sense of justice is the doctrine that the wicked dead are tormented with fire and brimstone in an eternally burning hell. That for the sins of a brief earthly life, they are to suffer torture as long as God shall live. She is calling what God teaches about hell repugnant. She says it goes against our sense of justice. Ellen White, your heart is wicked as hell. The Bible says they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night. In Mark it says, Jesus said, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands and go into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where their worm dieth not and the fire shall not be quenched. Read Mark chapter 9, Seventh-day Adventist, and you'll see that hell is real. It is a fiery torment. It is torture. But you don't have to go. The problem is, if a Seventh-day Adventist put their trust in keeping the law, they will go to hell. Yeah, right. If they trust in keeping the Sabbath, they will go to hell. Yeah, they will. Uh, about salvation, the Seventh-day Adventists teach, if you ask one, they'll say, well, it's just faith in Jesus. Hmm. I've heard a Mormon say that, though. You know, I've, I've even heard Seventh-day Adventists or, 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 or Jehovah's Witness or some of these other Christian cults allude to that. Well, it's just faith in Jesus. Well, that sounds right. But hey, as Christians, we are responsible to know how to dig deeper and ask more questions. The Seventh-day Adventists teach that faith in Jesus will forgive all of your sins in the past, but moving forward, you have to keep the Ten Commandments. Specifically, the Fourth Commandment. Specifically, the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Especially that. If you don't do that, well, then they would teach either you're not saved, you lost your salvation. What a wishy-washy way to teach works by giving faith lip service. Right. In Hebrews 10 it says, for the law having a shadow of things to come and not the very image of the things. That was a shadow of things to come. Yep. Those were pictures of what Jesus would do, how He would redeem us, but they don't understand that because it's spiritually discerned. Right. They don't have the Spirit of God. No, they They're don't. following this wicked spirit of Jezebel, Ellen White. Yeah. In Colossians 2 it says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Right. Ellen White worshipers, they love to judge Christians over the Sabbath day. Yeah. Over, Hey, don't judge me. Don't judge me. According to the Bible, you can't judge me whether or not I keep a Sabbath. 
Let no man therefore judge you in me or of Sabbath days, it just said. And yet they're quick to judge. Turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Look at verse number 19. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them and that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. So there in 20 when it talks about not eating the blood, I mean, that's, that's Old Testament, yes. Drinking blood has always been a wicked thing. That's why you see it in paganism. But look, he says in 21, For Moses of old time hath in every city then preached him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So even as they're talking about the Sabbath, they're saying, don't trouble them with anything else. Look, verse 24, For as much as ye have heard, that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, ye must be circumcised, and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. We are not required as Christians to keep God's law to keep our salvation. Yeah. The law is, have no other gods before me. The law is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. We've been saved through what Jesus did. That's right. But that's not what the SDAs are counting on. Look at verse 29. That ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye you keep yourselves, ye you shall do well. Fare ye well. Go back to Romans 14. So there we see this dialogue where they're literally telling you you're not required to keep the law to be saved because there was this big controversy over do we keep the Sabbath? Do we keep the ordinances? Jesus overturned that priesthood. right? How are you going to keep all of the Sabbaths and those, those, those feasts if there is no priesthood? But they foolishly have this new discovery in the late 1800s like every other cult that oh, we have the one true prophet. Hey, Acts 21, 25, it says, As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only they keep themselves from things offered to idols, and from blood, and from strangled, and from fornication. Very simple. Hey, as Christians, you should not fornicate, you should, you know, otherwise you're kicked out of the church. That's biblical. Yes. You're in Romans 14, look at verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Again, this is a Christian dealing with what God wants them to do. Is Saturday a holy day? Well, yes, as holy as every other day is, in my opinion, right? In my life, hey, and to God as well. Is Saturday a holy day? No. Hey, I'm fully persuaded in my own mind that I don't need to regard it unto the Lord. Hey, in fact, I think I need to do what God said. I need to work six days. I think I need to work that Saturday also. Yeah. I wish I could take it off and go soul winning. But according to the Bible, I need to work to prepare, provide for my family. There are Seventh-day Adventists that, will, that refuse to work and they like to make a big show. They want to be seen of men. That's right. they, just like all the other false prophets, look at us, look at us. Yeah. But you know, the majority of them are actually hypocrites. Right. They'll say, well, we don't eat meat. We don't eat red meat. We're better than that. And then they go home and they eat a bunch of processed food that came from who knows where. And look, this is not a godly. It's not godly for you to try to lift yourself up by saying, I don't do that or I keep the Old Testament commandments. Right. In fact, it's wicked. We're specifically warned about it. Jesus said, But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would have, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus fulfilled everything the Sabbath pictured, and He's the Lord of the Sabbath. Right, and He's telling them He would rather you have mercy than sacrifice. Right. And they say, oh, but I've sacrificed. I, I didn't do anything on Friday night and on Saturday. That's not what He wants. They're, they're wrong. They don't understand yeah. what Jesus teaches. They don't understand what He really wants. You know, and in fact, it's interesting because last week we read Romans 13 and in verse, what was it? Verse 9 it says, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, 
Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. I didn't hear the Sabbath in there. Right, yeah. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In fact, he goes on, he says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Keeping the Sabbath is not the fulfilling of the law. Right. Loving your brother, not hurting your brother. And the Seventh-day Adventists don't understand this because they've been led astray by this false prophet. And they need to reject Seventh-day Adventism and, and, and just trust in the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. alone. Yeah. They need to acknowledge that He is God Amen. and that He is the Savior alone. There's not a co-redeemer with the devil. Ellen White was a liar. He doesn't want you to sacrifice not eat, you know, and only eat veggies. He wants your heart. He wants you to trust in Him for salvation. And they worship the Sabbath day just to be seen of men. And these same Seventh-day Adventist churches, even though they say that you know, Christian churches that worship on Sundays are of the devil, they'll rent their facility out to another church on a Sunday. They do it all the time. Talk about hip hypocrites. Yeah, right. Hey, anything for money. Anything. anything. For money. Yeah. And they need to admit that Ellen White is a liar and that she's in hell. They need to get saved trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the only way they're going to be right with God. Right. And this applies to Christians. This chapter applies to Christians, to our family here. Understanding what Romans 14 is about is about how we should treat each other because you guys are saved. I'm saved. I don't need to... Be quick to judge you about how you eat or what you do on your weekend. I need to help you grow in the Lord. Yeah. And that's really the goal of this chapter. Fulfilling the law through love. Look at verse 3. It says, Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he hath been holding up, for God is able to make him stand. So again, as brothers and sisters, God is our master. Yeah. And yeah. God doesn't need you to run to Him and say, well, look what Adam did wrong. Right? He knows what I did wrong. Yeah. Right? Worry about your own stuff. And there is a place for judgment in the church, but not to the point where it causes division and controversy and gossip and backbiting. And God understands that people are different. And it talks about being persuaded in our own mind. There are things that the Lord has laid on me. I've decided with my children there are certain toys. I'm just never going to let them have it. I have decided there are certain toys. I will not allow it in my house. And you may say, hey, but I don't think that's wrong. Cool. No problem. Yeah. The problem is when I come to you and I say, hey, now, whoa, brother. You need to get rid of this toy. I've decided it's not good. Well, then we're in the area, that gray area of opinion. <coughs> And this is what this chapter is trying to help us to understand. And in the same regard, you may look at me and say, well, you don't let your child play with X, Y, and Z toys? Well, surely you're just overzealous. You're over much righteousness. That's wrong. Because, you know, we're under... Hey, leave it alone. And I'll leave you alone. And that's what God wants, is to have peace in regard of the things that are not specifically commanded. So we look, we touched on verses 5 and 6. Look at verse 7. It says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For we, for whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. As believers, again, fully persuaded is the phrase that's used in this chat, we need to make sure that we know why we're doing what we're doing. We need to have our own personal convictions and stick to them. Hey, in Colossians it says, Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. If you're doing it to be seen of men, and I don't care whether we're talking about wearing a tie or showing up early or if you want to show up in flip-flops just to be seen of men, like, hey, look, I'm free. Whatever, whatever it is, whether it's positive or negative or over much or under much, if you're doing it to be seen of men, you're doing it for the wrong reason. That's right. That's right. You're better off just doing it for the Lord. Amen. Look at verse 9 here. He says, For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that He might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Hey, there's the Gospel right there. And we have believed that. We trust in the Gospel. And because of that, we need to be peacemakers. Right? We need to have unity in the church. And having unity, we have to understand that, that you know, we don't compromise on doctrine. We don't compromise on standards. But when it's a gray area 
and it's my personal conviction over yours, I need to shut my mouth and not offend you. That pleases the Lord. That's the peacemaking that He wants. Look, He says, verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You're saved. You're going to stand before Him. There are certain things that if you say in my family we're doing it, cool. If there's a problem with that, God will deal with you on it. Whether here or there. If it's something that's clearly obvious, fornicating, drunkenness, Hey, we deal with that. We're going to deal with that. That's righteous. That's what we ought to do. Yeah. And there's a lot of other things that we need to just learn to leave it alone. Because yes, especially in our movement, we have a lot of people at different stages in their life. Right? If you saw me 10 years ago, you might look and say, I don't know, I've, this, he's not really growing. He's not really in a good church. He may not even be saved. I don't see him going out soul winning. Well, maybe his hair's too long. Well, maybe he does this wrong. Maybe his, he's got bad habits. Right? We, if you judge my habits rather than my heart, then, then there's a problem. And we have people that come into this movement, they get saved, they get on fire for the Lord, and they're not where you're at. They don't look like you look, they don't dress like you look, they still may have habits that you, you have deemed for yourself are unacceptable. Love that person. Yeah. Help them grow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, It's easy to pick a fight, right? But the hard thing is to just lay it down and not pick a fight. Let you know. And that's what, that's what we're learning here. Look at verse 11. It says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of everyone else in the church. Is that what it says? No. What's it say? We will give account of what? Himself, himself to God. Yeah. Not even your own wife or your own husband. It's only yourself. Right. And we should live by these convictions to be seen of God, not of man, and then we can have a pure conscience before God. Yeah. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Right? I won't let me eating bacon offend you if you don't let it offend you either. Right? <laughs> and it's funny, you, you laugh at that, but there's, I actually had a friend and he refused to eat bacon. And he well he shows me in the Old Testament where it talks about those that eat bacon and you know and not just in the early part of the New Testament but in the latter part of the prophets about judgment coming, and he felt fully persuaded in that. I thought okay I'll I'll let that one go, but we need to talk about your chick tracks. Why do you use chick tracks if you know that it's a repent of your sins gospel? Let's not talk about bacon. Let's talk about the false gospel, right? That's a fight worth picking, right? But not trying to force him or trick him into eating ham. That'd be wrong on my part. Verse 14, I know I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, Amen. but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Right? Again, personal convictions based on Scriptures. Hey, we ate goat meat over here. I, I, I went to Brother Joe's house and ate some goat meat. Some of you may look and say, that's unclean, man. I but then you'll go to Taco Bell. Hey, I won't judge your Taco Bell. Don't talk about my goat meat, okay? <laughs> Shots fired. There you go. <laughs> Look at verse 15. But, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Now turn to Galatians chapter 2. Again, we need to help each other grow. Right? We don't need to just look for things to pick fights. We don't need to look for the differences. We need to find what we have in common and grow on those things. And, you know, organic food is a good example of it. I try to eat organic. I try to stay, you know, GMO free and pesticide free and no processed food. And do I always do that? No. Is it, is, is it the perfect way? Maybe. If there's somebody that brings in McDonald's in here and I personally feel a conviction against them, is it my place to run over there and tell them how wicked McDonald's is? Not really. There's such a gray area here. And let me, you know, I love knowledge and I do believe that there are certain foods that you defile your body or there are certain things you can do and you're defiling your body. And I feel, I feel that I can encourage people by informing them, but at the same time, I am not supposed to come over and, you know, hey, you're, that's a wicked sin. You better put that Starbucks down. You know, I mean, come on, there, there has to be a, 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 you know, balance in our judgment one toward another because especially when it's things that are not specifically clear. And what I don't want to do is cause them to doubt, right? 
there may be somebody that eats fast food every day and I'm trying, I'm trying to convince them and I may cause them to doubt, then I would be in sin. And here I could eat organic and pesticide free and still end up getting sick and they could live longer, right? Some of those things are outside of our hands. I do believe it's best to do the best you can. And that should be your attitude. You know, this is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And if I, in retrospect, when I get to heaven, find out that, you know, my a habit or maybe eat ice cream or maybe those processed food, maybe you eat cereal, maybe there's something that actually caused you to shave off a year of your life. And in retrospect, you say, I could have been a, been a better soul winner had I given up my cereal or my ice cream or my Dunkin' Donut coffee or whatever it is. You know what I mean? So in that regard, I do feel zealous about, hey, I should try to do the best I can. But we have to be cautious and not make it bleed over and cause other people to doubt their own stands, especially when it's something not specifically addressed in the Scriptures. In Titus 1, he says, Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Hey, and we ought to be pure and have all things pure. In the sense of, hey, I'm just going to get dinner and I'm not going to worry about it. I want to ask the Lord to bless it. I'm going to give Him thanks. And it's sanctified through that, not through the ingredients. You know, that ought to be our focus. Amen. You're in Galatians chapter 2. Look at verse number 3. It says, But neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. The bondage here is the bondage of the works of the law for righteousness. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the Gospel might continue with you. Remember when he said, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations? Here he's saying, we gave place, no, not for an hour. We didn't put up with it. All people are welcome in our church, but not all doctrine, right? If we have somebody come, oh, I love to preach and I love to sing and I love the old fashioned, but then they try to like pull you aside and start telling you about Calvinism. Well, now you know, we, I mean, we we will have repentance in our life. We will start doing the good works if we're truly. Whoa, we got a problem. You know, we need to we need to with, look at the next verse. He said, or look at verse eleven. He says, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Right? He, was, he was zealous against these Judaizers. People that would sneak in and try to have false doctrine. We need to be aware of this and we need to be, we need to be protecting of each other. Because if a false prophet comes in here, he's going to try to pull away who he might think is the weakest. Yeah. Maybe somebody that doesn't have the best doctrine. They don't know everything yet. Let me try to get them in a corner and try to teach them something different. Yeah. And that's what we have to be careful of in churches. Look, he says, for before, verse 12, but for before that certain men came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But then when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Barnabas was a great man of God. He was a prophet. He was a preacher. He was a soul winner. He knew doctrine, but yet he's following the leader. He was carried away with the dissimulation. Oh, well, oh, maybe I should. Oh, is that how we should do it? That's why we have to be very cautious who we esteem and why we esteem them and what they're teaching. Verse 13, he says, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away. Look at verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the Gospel. So what's our litmus test? The Gospel. Yep. I say unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Jews, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Why are you trying to make them fall under the law? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Go ahead and turn back to Romans 14. So again, he makes this point, according to the Gospel, what they were saying goes against the Gospel. And he wanted to make a, a point of it. He rebuked him to the face. He made a big show. He wanted everybody to know, hey, and he was saved too, but he was teaching error. 
You know, and sometimes we forget that that you know going to heaven only requires faith in Jesus. It's simple, but that does not mean you're automatically going to have all your doctrine right. Who in here has taught bad doctrine? Even after you were saved? Of course. I had a guy one time I'm out soul winning with, and he was new to the faith. He he found our church by watching uh, Pastor Anderson, and he told him to go to Fort. He would live real close, and he started coming to the church. I kept encouraging him to come out soul winning. He's coming out soul winning. And we're standing there soul winning, and he starts telling this, this young lady about Abraham's bosom. Uh-oh. I kept my mouth shut. The girl got saved. We're walking down the street. Then I started to show him a more excellent way. Then I started to compel him out of the Scriptures. Hey, look, that's not really true. Let me show you this. Let me show you that. And man, he felt so bad. Even the next week, he's coming to me. Man, I'm so sorry. I feel bad. You know, it's okay. It's all right. I've said things about the rapture to people that I was wrong. But thank God I know the truth now. Yeah. And we ought to have, if we have that spirit and that attitude, it's, it's all right when you're wrong. In fact, it's good because then you become tempered. You've been tested and tried and you're, you're presented with the truth and you say, I want to know the truth. That means I've got to know where I'm wrong. Now that I know, I'm passionate about it. I'm on fire and I can instruct others. You know, so it's okay when we're wrong, but you know, having, having that right spirit and right attitude. There in Galatians, the last thing he said was, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And that's what Judaizers are teaching. That's what you have to keep the Sabbath. You have to keep the law. And, and any of these Baptist churches, because they're all over the place around here, it looks like their gospel's right. They dress up right. They got the right Bible. Old hymns, cool. But then when you really get down to brass tacks, yeah. they're teaching, if I don't see your works, then you're not really saved. Right. Yeah. Man, we got a problem. Yeah. We are not walking in the same steps. And I, I'll be glad to show them out of the Scriptures, but if they reject it, then I'm not going to have fellowship with that. Yeah, that's right. Look here in Romans 14. Let's look at verse 16. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You remember what, what Jesus said? We quoted it earlier where He says, I would have mercy and not sacrifice. Right? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is in mercy and peace. Joy through the Holy Ghost. We have true joy by being right with God. And when we let other people cause us to doubt or cause us to stumble, then there's a problem. We're in bondage. Joy is not being in bondage. He says, For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. God's the judge. That's, that's the, our standard bearer. Yeah. If I decide for Christmas I'm going to do something that's different than you, as long as you're not worshiping the devil, worshiping Santa Claus, let's be real though. Yeah. Let's be real. Yeah, right. As long as you're, you're not going to dress up and teach your kids that Santa's real, yeah. then I'm, I don't care what your tradition is. That's alright. Yeah. But when you take your tradition and you try to force it on me and say it's the will of God, that's when we have a problem. Yeah. Look, he says, let us then follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify one another. The goal here is to edify. You know, we're on Christmas. You know, If you decide to have a Christmas tree and you decide not, if you go after Him or you go after Him, we've got a problem. Sure. It's, just, it's not right. It's not specifically addressed in the Bible. There are certain gray areas. You know, if you want to sing Jingle Bells, you know, I have a question the lyrics, but again, it's, you know, be convinced of the Lord. If the Lord tells you, shut up, don't sing that song anymore, then you better do something with it. If I tell you, you need to question where I'm coming from, you know. Look, the, the, again, the goal is to edify, to build the church. Help each other grow in doctrine and in knowledge of the Word. That's our goal here in this church as a family. If someone comes in here and tries to pull you away, pull you over in the corner and teach you, oh man, that the law, what we have to do the law, rebuke them sharply, do it to the face, and warn everybody else. Don't hesitate. I mean, if they're teaching work salvation, you need to proclaim it. You need to put a stop to it. Yeah. Tell let everybody know there's a false prophet. If someone is weak and they think God wants them to not eat bacon, but they're saved, don't argue with them. But don't let them argue with you either. Right. right? Take a stand where you're at. Don't try to convince them your way, but don't let them start doubtful disputations. Yeah. Yeah. Look at verse 20. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Don't discourage somebody. Imagine a new person comes in, they just get saved, and they really like eating bacon, 
and you start telling them, well, no, you've got to give that up, then they get discouraged. Well, I thought it was just faith, and now i got to do this, and i got to do that, and I have to wear a suit on Sunday, and I have to dress. They get disturbed. You know, then you're putting an offense. You're stopping the work of God because of things that aren't... Like it says, destroy not the work of God. For meat, destroy not the work of God. I think that really goes to help us understand the essence of what he's saying here. Over what you have for dinner, don't let that stop our soul winning, yeah, our right. preaching the Gospel, our growing yeah. together. Don't discourage others. Verse 21, It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. And in the same regard, you being the mature Christian, and you're sitting at dinner, and you find out that it offends them to eat, eat pork, okay, just get a burger and move on. Don't try to offend them. Don't make them look at it. Oh, it's so good. You don't know what you're missing. No, man. Just you know, I think the Lord would reward you even if you just said, "Okay, I have a chicken salad." <laughs> you know, it's all right. I don't want to offend you, brother. So tell me, what are you doing for the Lord? What do you know about the rapture? You know, worry about those things. Worry about their doctrine. <laughs> don't offend your your saved brother over his personal convictions. And you think about you know, like like dresses and skirts as an example. You know, that's sort of a personal choice. Now, the Lord tells us what nakedness is, right? From here to here. So, if, if you decide that your wife, she's going to wear skirts to here, and I decide my wife, she's going to wear them all the way to her ankle, if I could, well, hey, now, look, that's not to the ankle. Well, that's, that's the gray area. God clearly tells us to the end of the thigh is nakedness. If your knees are showing, if, if you're you know, showing your thigh there at the joint where the knee is, well, then you've got a problem. You're going against God's law. But then for somebody else to get overzealous and say, well, you need to wear something that goes all the way to the end. Now, that's not what God said. Now, is it? No. God's clear on certain things. And some people trying to be over much righteousness, they do go above and beyond. And if you've decided in your house, we're going to the floor, we're going to the ankles, hey, cool, more power to you. You know what I mean? My wife doesn't only wear skirts to the ankle, but she wears skirts. And they cover her knee or she's not going out of the house. If her nakedness is covered according to the Scriptures and I stand before God on that, everything else that you do, that's up to you. And we're going to preach what God says. We're not going to preach the gray areas and make it a point of division in our church. Look, he says, Hast thou faith, verse 22. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. That's true happiness. Knowing that you're right with God. I'm doing everything that I see that God wants me to do. But, you know, God's law... You know, people use certain verses also in this chapter to go the other direction. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not convicted of it, you know. Hey, God's law is not to be drunk. That you should be sober. That means no weed, no beer, no pills. And I've heard many people try to use certain... Well, you know, I'm, I'm content. I haven't been convicted of it. He didn't talk to me about that. So I just keep on you know, doing what I'm doing. Well, no. God said no, that you should be sober. That's right. So you can't take things out of balance. As long as you're in balance with God's law, you will have true happiness. Amen. And when you're not, and you try to persuade others, otherwise, you're going to have problems. God will judge you for those things. You're causing other people to doubt. And you can't ignore God's law. You've got to keep reading. Oh, I found a great verse in Romans. That means I can still smoke weed. and It's okay. No. You're not being sober. You've got to keep reading. Right. Don't just stop there. Look, he says in verse 23, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And that wraps up this chapter, but it wraps up a lot of our actions before God. It ought to be in faith, and then you're not sinning. In the same way that love fulfills the law, as long as I love you, I'm not going to steal from you. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to do any of those other things, right? If I'm truly in love, I'm not going to lie to you. Well, in the same way, as long as I'm in faith with the Lord, I trust what His Word says, you know, there may come a point where you find out what you were doing was wrong. When you're confronted, make a change. You know, I, used to, I joked about Chinese restaurants. I don't say this to cause you to doubt or to say don't ever eat Chinese restaurant. But if you go in there and, they, and there's a Buddha statue and they're saying we sacrifice this meat unto Buddha... You probably shouldn't eat there. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm not saying this to cause you to doubt, but I use it as an example. If you walk in the door and you go past the statue and you never even see it, you sit down, you start eating, you never even see it, you never even notice, it's never brought to your attention, it's not a sin. Right? It's the moment when you doubt. If, you, if I know all oh, but this one restaurant, it's so good, but I'm not sure. I, I think it's 
I don't think God's happy. I'm going to go eat anyway because it's a good buffet. And you sit there and you try to eat and you're looking over at that Buddha statue and you try not to... Hey, that's a sin. You're eating, you're doubting while you're doing it, you know? We ought to know. And it's funny because sometimes we have that attitude kind of like, like I can just cover my eyes and God won't see me. You know what I mean? <laughs> Come on, man. God sees yeah. everything. Yeah. And He wants us to have balance in our life. He wants us to have balance in our church. He wants us to love each other and not be offended easily at the decisions we, at the others make. Well, you know, the, the length of the skirt, what kind of toys and what we do or don't do. You know, as long as it's lined up in God's Word, we can agree on those things. Don't look for reasons to pick a fight with your brother. We need to edify and encourage, and then we'll be happy. Right. We'll have true happiness. We'll have joy in the Holy Spirit, and that ought to be our goal. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for everything You've taught us so far out of Romans. We look forward to the next couple chapters as we end it up, Lord. And I just pray that You would help us to commit these things to heart and to help understand an application and be ready to encourage people and not tear them down but also to beware of false prophets that are not brethren that try to twist scriptures to justify their works lord we know that salvation is faith alone and we love you for that lord and help us to go out and proclaim it more and more thank you jesus amen, amen. amen.